He needs no introduction, so I won't introduce him. Larry Lessig. Thank you, David. It's great fun to be back after 400 years, I think, or maybe 200. I can't remember exactly. Um, talking about decades, anyway. decades at least. Um, talking about uh, a mix, a remix, we could say, between the issues that I used to talk with you about and the issues I want to encourage you to talk about now. So, start with some familiar stories. The most familiar story coming from my word mouth around copyright. As many of you know, I spent many years in the battles around copyright. I became an activist on October 27, 1998, when the president signed into a law, a statute honoring this great American, the Sonny Bono Copyright Term Extension Act, a statute which extended the term of existing copyrights by 20 years. Now, when Congress passed the statute, the question that was to be in their head was, did it advance the public good, this, as we could call it, Mickey Mouse Protection Act? But the question of whether it advanced the public good is a strictly economic question about whether extending an existing copyright might have that positive public benefit. Well, when we took this question to a bunch of economists, including this Nobel Prize winning right-wing economist, Milton Friedman, the answer from the economist was universal. Of course, it couldn't advance the public good. A monopoly granted through copyright is to create incentives, and the one thing we know about incentives is that they are prospective only. Not even the United States Congress could get George Gershwin to produce anything more. So when Congress asked the question, does it advance the public good, the answer to that question should obviously be no. And when we wrote a, uh, a, a brief that got these 13 economists, including these five Nobel Prize winners, to join, challenging the statute as not possibly advancing the public good. Milton Friedman said he would join the brief only if the word no-brainer was somewhere in the brief. <laughs> so obvious was it that you couldn't advance the public good by extending the term of an existing copyright. But apparently there were no brains in this place when Congress unanimously extended the term of this existing copyrights. What there was was more than $6 million in contributions from Disney and other copyright interests eager to have their copyrights extended, the public good be damned. Or here's a second story around Spectrum. As you all know, it's the standard <clears throat> that Spectrum is regulated all around the world. Originally, we were told it has to be so. We were told it has to be so by a lawyer. Should have made you suspicious when that happened. This lawyer, Justice Murphy, the Supreme Court case, NBC versus US, wrote, owing to its physical characteristics, radio, unlike other methods of conveying information, must be regulated and rationed by the government. Otherwise, there would be chaos, and radio's usefulness would lar be largely destroyed. So the Supreme Court gave us the Politburo of radio regulation. That's the FCC. And what the FCC then did is what all Politburos did, allocate the resources according to their view about what allocation made most sense. Well, about 13 years after the Supreme Court did that, another Nobel Prize winning economist, um, Ronald Coase, began to wonder why the government had to be allocating this resource. And Coase said, the spectrum shouldn't be a government-granted privilege, like every resource, we should just think of spectrum as a sort of property that could be bought and sold by those to whom the property is assigned. So rather than allocation, we would have owners of spectrum. And so spectrum then in this model could be reallocated as the market demands. Now, I think there's no doubt this is a much better way to allocate spectrum, assuming the way we use spectrum was something like this, broadcast, loud blots of spectrum um, in contexts where the ability to control was central. If that's the model, then Coase was right. But before Coase and before Murphy, there was another model of spectrum <laughs> articulated by Hedy Lamarr in the context of a patent which she received for the use of her spectrum device, suggesting a different way was possible to allocate spectrum, shared spectrum. Spectrum Commons. And if, in fact, you could allocate Spectrum in a way that allowed different devices to share it, there would be no reason to license the Spectrum, no reason to own the Spectrum. So how could that be done? Well, when this debate first started, uh, it was a little bit hard to explain to people 
how you could share spectrum, around 2000 at least. People's model for spectrum was a lot like Flight Control, this app where if you had two different apps that were using the same space of spectrum, they would collide and then blow up or something like that. But today, people have a very clear intuition about how we could share spectrum because all of us do it all of the time in the context of Wi-Fi, which of course is a technology where without allocating who gets to use what at any one particular time, we have code functioning as the law, which facilitates this sharing of this resource in an extraordinarily efficient way. And indeed, as David Reed, another of the original founders of the conception of how we think of the internet believes, we could allocate spectrum in a way that would allow more users to actually increase the capacity of the spectrum. Okay, so 2001, when I wrote this book, no one really knew which way was best. And so in 2001, the conventional wisdom was that we needed a period of experimentation period where we could test the models of Stalin and Coase and Hedy Lamarr against each other and see which one worked best. And everybody on the right and the left and in the FCC was talking about this need for experimentation. So let's spin ahead to where we are today. And this idea of experimentation has been weirdly morphed into the idea that there's really only one true model of the true and effective way to allocate spectrum. It's Ronald Coase's model. And what has accounted for the slow movement of this dead policy idea? The millions of little lobbyists around this idea <laughs> who have come to recognize an obvious fact. Who is going to make money if spectrum is free. And so unfree spectrum increasingly becomes the new normal inside this beltway. Ideas be damned or evidence be damned or good public policy be damned driven by this strong incentive inside Washington. Or one final point that we're going to talk about uh, in the panel, broadband. Now, as all of you know, broadband in the US sucks. It's a technical legal term, but that's what it does. It sucks. Any number of measurements, here's where we stand. Countries that beat us at the very top include France, for God's sake. Now, how's that possible? But there it is. We suck relative even to France. Okay. Now, of course, it sucks on average. States vary, are very different in how bad they suck in broadband provision. North Carolina was a particularly bad example of state broadband provision. According to this study, North Carolina ranked last in its access to uh, speeds that qualify as broadband. Now, the reason in both of these cases and all of these cases for broadband sucking is easy to identify. It's this image. It's a little competition or poor competition or no competition which yields the reality of sucky broadband. And that suggests an obvious solution. The solution is competition, right? So, in fact, in 1996, Congress thought they were going to create uh, an environment of competition. They enacted an open access rule for broadband provision, not for cable, but for telecom, DSL. Um, but by 2000, that conventional wisdom of 1996 had been inverted and the model of rejecting open access had been extended to DSL. So there was no longer open access either in the DSL space or in the cable space, producing a death in the competition. Okay. The response to that terrible decision by our government to end the real competition in broadband provision, the very kind of kind of competition that had produced extraordinary broadband access in countries like France, was that communities across the country began to think maybe we should build our own infrastructure. So North Carolina in particular had communities that were building their own infrastructure to create competition. And as this great little graph from Uni Networks describes, they were extremely successful. These are the traditional broadband providers who are pro providing asymmetrical, slow and expensive internet provision. And these were the new community providers who are providing symmetrical, fast uh, broadband provision competitive with any place in the world, including France. Okay, so that was the way out of this world of no competition, giving us something other than sucky broadband. What was the response to this response? ominous legislation with titles like leveling the playing field local government competition acts, which basically blocked this local competition. 
This was a statute introduced in, in uh, North Carolina originally by the GOP-controlled uh, legislature. It passed the legislature, and then there began an extraordinary campaign to get the Democratic governor to veto this crazy legislation. But H-129, which we tried to get her to veto, and thousands of calls tried to support it, including resolutions by the local communities, produced not the result of a veto, but her allowing the law to become law exactly a year ago yesterday without her signature. And the justification for allowing this blocking of local competition, there is a need to establish rules to prevent cities and towns from having an unfair advantage over providers in the private sector. Unfair advantage? What's the unfairness in this? To recognize the lack of competitive broadband, to respond to the lack of competitive broadband, to defend the community against the lack of competitive broadband, provide competitive broadband? Is it unfair when the st cities provide streetlights or when they build highways? Because, of course, we could have private highways. Or when they build bridges, we could, of course, have toll bridges built by private industries. These are not instances of unfairness. Because what economists have taught us is that infrastructure requires support of communities and governments to get the optimal amount of infrastructure. Infrastructure, like the internet, has public support as essential. So the unfairness claim here is absurd. So if it's not unfairness, what explains it? Well, in March of this year, this fantastic organization, the National Institute of Money in State Politics, did a study of North Carolina and found what anybody would have predicted. Supporters of this legislation received 76 times the uh, contributions from these uh, telecom companies as opponents, and leaders in the legislature who pushed this legislation through got five times the amount of money as opponents to the legislation. Okay, now, three examples. What do they all have in common? This picture, but this picture in a particular dynamic. Money to an incumbent, which inspires an endless war by that incumbent to protect a status quo. But what they know is that we'll get bored fighting that war, we'll move on, and so they plan to wage this endless war to protect their status quo for that policy. They call this an investment. Conservatives call this crony capitalism. I call this the opportunity for a great question. How do we fight against these endless warriors. Okay, so here's the suggestion. It's not too complicated. It's be smart, but not smart in a Einstein sense, more in a Cory Doctorow-like sense, kind of clever in the way we think about the strategy to respond to these endless warriors. So here are three tiny suggestions for a clever strategy and response. The first one is that we have to frame these issues smarter frame these issues so that they appeal to a wider range of a community and strike people as obvious as opposed to striking them as hard as con and contested. So a particular example in the context of copyright extremism debates. The internet, of course, since the birth of the internet, has seen this fight about copyright. It's a fight. Some refer to it as war. Some refer to it as a copyright war. My friend, the late Jack Valenti, used to refer to it as his own, quote, terrorist war, where apparently the terrorists in this war are our children. But this war has been a fight about artists' rights, fought by artists, especially artist representatives. And in that fight, we've been challenging them. They've been defending it. But here's the point. If you rise above the din of that fight, both sides acknowledge copyright in some form, the right form of copyright, is essential in that space for some creative work Copyright is essential to make it possible for certain kind of creators to be able to afford the independence that their creativity requires. But at the time, same time we have that essential copyright fight, there's another copyright fight going on, a fight where copyright is not essential. And too often, this fight gets ignored. So, for example, in the particular, in the context of science. I was paging through my Harvard Gazette, um, recently came across this wonderful article about a new economist, Gita Gopinath at Harvard. The author of the article obviously ran out of questions, so she, he asked the um, 
Gita, um, why don't you have anything on your shelves? And she responded, everything I need is on the internet now. Everything I need is on the internet now. What exactly does that mean? Well, I wanted to test it, so I did a little study. I've been working on the area of corruption, so I wanted to see the top articles on campaign finance. So I went to Google Scholar, I searched campaign finance, but I searched it not as a professor at Harvard, I searched it off the Harvard network as an ordinary citizen, got the top articles, and then I started going through these articles to see what I could see without having them on my shelf anymore. So I came to this article, it's gonna cost me $29.95 for the, uh, that, the top article. Second article was protected by JSTOR, terms not clear. Third article, $29.95. Fourth article, free, as long as I signed up for a yearly subscription of $99.95. Fifth article, protected by JSTOR. Sixth article, I could get from JSTOR for $10. Seventh article, protected by JSTOR. Eighth article, JSTOR. Ninth article, JSTOR. Tenth article, $29.95. Okay, so when she says, Everything is on the internet now. What does she mean? She means if, and this is a big if, you're a tenured professor at an elite university or a professor at an elite university or students and professors at elite university or a student and professors at a U.S. university, if you're one of those people, the knowledge elite, then you have free access. But to the rest of the world, not so much. Now, we should name this fact. We should name it outrageous. Here, Hillary Clinton gave us a way to characterize it, though. <laughs> outrageous. And it's outrageous because we built this world. We academics built this world. It flows from the choices we make about copyright, decisions we make about how we're allocating our copyright as we produce and distribute and publish our work. There is not one of the authors of these articles who gets money from copyright not one of them who wants the distribution of his or her article limited, not one of them whose business model turns on restricting access to the articles, not one of them who should support this system. So every one of them is a recruit to the cause that gets people to recognize the way copyright can be misused in this context against the interest of copyright or the authors who are promoting it. They can be a recruit and others well, as well in this fight against this copyright extremism. By framing the fight smarter, we can get more people inside to recognize why the current battle makes no sense. That's number one. Here's number two. Practice this smarter. Now, the Chatterati... ...those people. There are a lot of important issues the nation should be facing, not this one. So they started this list, move on, and within a couple of weeks, millions of people had joined it, Democrats and Republicans alike, to demand the Congress censure the president and just move on. This was the first, I think, really important testament to the potential of this exopolitics welling up and having a significant effect. I think the Tea Party patriots, the grassroots part of the Tea Party movement before it was taken over by the Beltway Republicans or Fox News, these people were another example of this kind of exopolitics taking advantage of this infrastructure to build a political movement. The Occupy movement, similarly. The Stop Sopa Pippa movement, similarly. But what's interesting is since this time, over the course of this year, we've seen a, a, a rush of these rush-like uh, activities that have increasingly identified targets and acted effectively against them because the infrastructure facilitates and the web is now tuned to making something like this happening, and leading some to begin to fear this generalized power of a net uprising, this one tech company is saying it's cyberbullying, which of course leads us to say poor tech companies. But the point is it recognizes the capacity that has been enabled here. Now, we have to understand though, this thing about this capacity, it invites a different kind of leadership. This fantastic book, which I've only recently come across by Braffman and Beckstrom, described the difference between leadership and the model of the spider, which has a central nervous system and a brain-like thing, not really a big brain, but anyway, a brain-like thing, and the starfish, which has no central nervous system. And he says, these the two authors say, all the interesting movements in the internet age are leaderless. They have no central command. So this political exopolitics is not the spider, it's the starfish, which means that it can't be commanded 
Nobody can issue orders, turn up and protest. It might be nudged, it certainly can be encouraged, but we should think of it as the politics of body surfing. You've got to stand in the water and wait for the right wave. And once it comes, you can feed the movement, you should respect the movement, you can encourage the movement, but the movement is not yours to command. Now, I think if there's hope in the battles that we care about, it's here in this exopolitics movement. But to figure out how to practice this exopolitics movements smarter, to encourage them better, is a key part of the strategy of figuring out how to step back against the power that is fighting these endless wars. And then one final move. Got to see these wars smarter. Got to see them with the wisdom of this man's eyes. This is Henry David Thoreau. 1846, Thoreau, writing at Walden, wrote on Walden with this passage. There are a thousand hacking at the branches of evil to one who is striking at the root. So I'll call that one a root striker. And what the root striker can do is to step back from the fights that dominate the political space and recognize the connection between them. Recognize that there is a common cause to the craziness that manifests itself in each of these spaces. And recognize that until we address that root cause, we won't get progress in any of these issues on both the left and the right. Now, my view is that there is a root cause to the craziness we see in a wide range of policy spaces, and that root cause should be called corruption. Not corruption in the brown paper bag sense of corruption, not Rob Lagojevich kind of corruption, but instead corruption relative to the baseline our framers gave us for our government. So the framers gave us what they called a republic. But by a republic, they meant a representative democracy. And by a representative democracy, Federalist 52 tells us they meant a government with a branch that would be, quote, dependent upon the people alone. Right, so here's their model of government, the people and the government. I do my own slides. It's cool the way that bounces like that, right? So people and the government creating this exclusive dependency, exclusive dependency. Here's the problem. Congress has evolved a different dependence. No longer just a dependence upon the people alone. It is a dependence increasingly on the funders. As members spend between 30 and 70% of their time raising money to get back to Congress or to get their party back into power, they develop, as any of us would, a sixth sense, a constant awareness of how what they do might affect their ability to raise money. They become, in the words of the X-Files, shape shifters, as they constantly adjust their view in light of what they know will raise money, not in issues 1 to 10, but in issues 11 to 1,000. Leslie Byrne, a Democrat from Virginia, describes when she came to Congress, she was told by a colleague, quote, always lean to the green. Then to clarify, she went on, he was not an environmentalist. <laughs> Now, the point is, this is a dependence, too, but it's a different and conflicting dependence from a dependence upon the people alone because, surprise, surprise, the funders are not the people. 0.26%. I know you're saying he's a lawyer, doesn't know how to do percentages, but I really mean 0.26%. A quarter of 1% of Americans give more than $200 in a congressional election. 0.05% give the maximum amount in any congressional campaign. 0.01%, the 1% of the 1%, give $10,000 or more in an election cycle. And my favorite statistic, 0.000063%, 196 Americans have given more than 80% of the super PAC money spent so far in this presidential election. So the Occupy Wall Street people are so proud of the we are the 99% slogan, I think it's bad marketing. I think they're the 99.74% or 99.95% or 99.99% or 99.999937%, depending on which statistic you want to use to measure their relative insignificance compared to the significance of those who fund their elections. That is corruption relative to the framer's idea of who should be calling the shots and we should call it corruption to focus the energy necessary to change this. Now, a root striker says we need to see this. And then we also need to see that until we change this, this picture, again, is the picture for all legislation that we care about. Same as it ever was, 
is the picture for every issue from global warming to tax policy to any issue. This is the way government will not function. Now, I would never fling myself to a conference of people concerned about the issues that you are focused on in Freedom to Connect and tell you, give that up and focus your energy on this first. It's not my purpose today. I don't think you should make this your most important issue. But I do think you need to make it your second most important issue. I think you and every other group out there that has a cause from environmentalists to healthcare advocates to global warming advocates to people who think we spend too much money and people who think we tax too unfairly, every one of these groups has to recognize that until they band together with people they don't agree with and identify this as the root problem, we get no progress. All of us, in some sense, need to tithe for reform, take 10% of what we do or 20% of what we do and devote it to this e effort because nothing gets fixed until we fix this. And this structure, this route, enables the endless warrior that we are focused on at this conference. It fuels the crony capitalism, which is what the endless warrior is a manifestation of, and it disables, I think, the real promise of this freedom to connect, not just here, but the freedom to connect that this network makes possible across the world. Thank you very much for the time.